bunch of riffraff coming in late. That's what you get called if you, just so you know, if you're here on time, you know that we talk about. <coughs> All right, Brent, you're going to lead a prayer and include Don's mom and stuff. So. Did you announce the prayer? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are prayer requests that we need to add to anybody. I guess we should include Pam Campbell through yep. recovery. Um, That's about the God and Father. We are blessed to be here this evening. <coughs> the Father, we pray as we <clears throat> look forward to the study of your word and we thank you for Mike. We thank you for his such diligent study and his love for the word, his love for us as he brings it to us. But Father, we always pray that through our study that it's not just an intellectual exercise. But Father, that we look for, for all scripture to guide, to lead us, to change us, to transform us, and uh, to draw closer to you. <clears throat> the Father, tonight we want to honor a prayer request from our brother Don Conley. His mother has been ill for, for a very long time with dementia, and now uh, it appears she's having kidney failure and, and renal failure. The Father, we pray for healing, if it be your will, but <clears throat> we pray for comfort in her illness and sickness. Pray for Don and Mary as they attend to her needs, give them strength and wisdom and courage at this time. <laughs> And Father, we pray for our sister Pam Campbell as uh, her recent uh, fall and recent surgery. Dear Father, we pray for a speedy recovery for her as well and complete recovery. And pray that she's encouraged and we pray that we can encourage her as well. Again, Father, thank you for being our God. Thank you for, for your son. Thank you for the salvation that comes through him. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. We are overviewing uh, the books of the New Testament. Um, one or two or three weeks on uh, on each book we're doing. We are in Philemon tonight, which is a one chapter book. So there's a pretty good chance we can do it in one week. We'll see. Uh, there, it's actually uh, loaded with really helpful uh, biblical information so so we're right before hebrews if you can find hebrews at one page of uh philemon uh, and the writer of the letter is paul uh begins with chapter one verse one paul a prisoner of christ jesus and timothy our brother to philemon our brother a beloved brother and fellow worker uh soldier uh and uh, to oh, sorry, our, 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 and to Aphia, our uh, sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the grace, the church in your house, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll get my brains screwed on straight here in a minute. Uh, so Paul is the writer uh, of the letter, the Apostle Paul, and uh, he is in prison again. There's five, you know, the Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians are kind of lumped together as the three prison letters when Paul is in prison of the he wrote 13 letters and Ephesians Philippians Colossians are traditionally called the prison letters although uh, in second Timothy he's in prison and also in Philemon he's in prison so you see in and in, in second Timothy he actually that is when uh, he, he dies after that they execute him after that so verse one Paul a prisoner and in verse uh, nine, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you since I am such a person as Paul the aged and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Uh, I appeal to you for my child whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, uh, Onesimus, in verse 13, uh, whom I wish to keep with me that in your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. And then verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, <clears throat> greet you. So Paul is writing uh, from prison. <clears throat> you know, some of the times when Paul was in prison, it was more like house arrest. 
<clears throat> it was very uh, loose and uh, fairly easy. He just kind of, he did have somebody with him, uh, a guard guarding him, but it was very relaxed uh, situation. He's not in chains, sitting in the bottom of a dungeon somewhere. And sometimes that did happen to him. Uh, the reader is the recipient of the letter is Philemon. And this is the only time his name is mentioned in the Bible, verse one. So Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker. Um, and so uh, it is uh, hinted at, or uh, some of the scholars think in verse two and two, Apia, our sister, that that is likely his wife, uh, Philemon's wife. And even to Archippus uh, in verse two, our fellow soldier and to the church in your house that that uh, Philemon, Ephia, Archippus is maybe his son who's a preacher and there's a church in Philemon's house. You know, a lot of the um, uh, places where the Christians uh, worship God in the first century were, were house churches. I mean, that that was the main once the Gentile movement started, it started with Jews becoming Christians, and they would worship still in the synagogues a lot uh, till, it, till, uh, till the uh, Jews got, some of the Jewish leaders got very angry and, and uh, kind of pushed them out. But when the Gentiles started being converted, and of course, in some communities, you had to have 10 Jewish men in order to have a synagogue. So in some of the communities, uh, when the Gentiles were being converted, it was a heavy Gentile area. They might not have a synagogue, a lot of places where they didn't have synagogues. And I mentioned before, um, when I was in Lithuania in 1998, uh, when we, we did uh, had a Russian girl named Natasha that did some touring with us and so on. She said in uh, Vilnius, the capital of uh, Lithuania, that uh, before World War II, before Hitler, Vilnius had 108 Jewish synagogues. And today there's only one. You know, so Hitler just, you know, his henchmen just wiped them out. And um, so, but point is, is that there were a lot of Jewish synagogues, and especially in Israel. And so, but when the Gentiles start being converted and it's more become, it starts to become, especially in Paul's case, you're outside of Judea. So you're up in, uh, up in modern day Turkey or what is Turkey today or over in Greece, uh, you know, like. Uh, Colossae and Laodicea, Ephesus, some of these others there, uh, Ephesus would have a heavy Jewish concentration, but like some of those other cities that we looked at, they'll have a, uh, those are modern day Turkey. And so uh, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, uh, Athens, Corinth, that's modern day Greece. So you, you're likely to have a lot of house churches. And then in Rome, a lot of house churches. So what would happen, I mean, like, uh, you know, where we were converted back in 1981, uh, which my spiritual birthday was uh, yesterday. And uh, so uh, uh, I've been rejoicing. Anyway, um, who would have thought, oh, God, I forgot to call Don and Kathy. I need to do that. Those are the couple that worked with us. I call them every year and tell them thank you. And, you know, a few years ago, Kathy told me that the missionary up there told her you're wasting your time on that Meyer offer. And uh, it's just pretty, he's a good friend of mine now. Uh, and I, I knew him a little bit. We, it's not that he didn't like me, just thought I was a waste of time because of the way I was living. You never know. That's <laughs> true. Yeah, I, I think we're pretty good friends now. He's been to Cambodia for us a few times. So, uh, happy think, birthday. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Big life change. Uh, long story. Anyway, so the church up there in St. Cloud, Minnesota, uh, was a house church. So they, it was a three bedroom, uh, high level house. And there were three bedrooms upstairs. Two of the bedrooms were classrooms for the children. The third one was as well, the master bedroom. And the master bedroom had a bathroom in it. That was a men's room. And then the ladies room was the main bathroom in the house. The kitchen sometimes was a classroom and the dining room sometimes was a classroom. Downstairs, the recreation room, are you familiar with, you know, I don't have any basements down here, but uh, the rec room was, uh, it wasn't this size. It was probably this long, but it was probably from that wall. It was probably about this, about this wide. 
and uh, the uh, the baptistry there was uh, uh, a two four by eight sheets of plywood that had, had been fiberglassed, and then a four by eight sheet of plywood that had been cut in half to make the ends, and that was fiberglassed with a four by eight sheet on the bottom fiberglass, and then they had a piece of indoor outdoor carpet on the on the floor, and they had two folding chairs. One on the outside, one on the inside. That was your ladder to get in and out. And the night that we were baptized, I've really digressed. The night that we were baptized into Christ, uh, it was March 26. So up there, there's like they just had like, I don't know, they had three feet of snow or something recently, a blizzard. My brother was born at home March 19th, 1951, in a blizzard. And so you, you know, so it was cold out. It was it was 10 degrees probably outside. And uh so at nine nine o'clock at night, I when I my lights came on, my I finally got it. I said we need to get baptized right now, and so I wasn't thinking. We had Adam was five, Mason four, Michael was five months old. We had to bundle the kids up, go warm the car up, drive over on the way over there. It uh, it's dawning on me. I don't know how warm it's going to be in that building. I hate cold water. First of all, we get to the building. I say, well, because we're a house church and we don't have any money. Uh, the, we turned the heat down to like 50 during the during the week. It's just turned up Wednesday night and Sunday. So I thought, okay, all right, that's all right. You know, I said, well, the other thing is, is that the we don't have the water heater turned on. So you, we can wait if you want to wait a few hours, and we'll try to heat the water up. Well, you know me, I go to bed kind of early. Get up early. I said, uh, oh man, I go, you know, just go ahead and go, you know. So they they filled that four by eight tank fiberglass plywood tank up with ice cold water out of the ground. And I hate cold water. And when I got in the water, I'm standing there and they asked me if I'm ready. I'm going, I, I, I'm up to my waist. I, I, I can't. I mean, I couldn't take it. And finally, I just screamed at him to just do it, you know. And Libby's out there laughing at me. I said, you're next, woman. Anyway, uh, but so anyway, that but it was, uh, uh, I, I won't forget the experience. So uh, it, it, it's, uh, you know, so the house church idea was very, prominent in the first century. So, uh, and there may have been more, you know, more than one house church in the city. There might've been several. Um, so, uh, so Paul is writing to Philemon and uh, probably a fiat, since it is to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, soldier and uh, uh, fellow worker and to Apia, our sister and to Archibus, our fellow soldier, and to the house, uh, uh, the church in your house, all kind of seems like they're kind of lumped together. So anyway, it doesn't make a uh, big difference, but it's, it's possible that that is the case. If you back up just briefly to Colossians, uh, we see the other reference to um, Archippus, Archippus, however you want to say it. So in chapter four, the end of Paul's letter to the Colossians, uh and again, Colossae is in modern-day Turkey, not a very prominent town at that time. So he closes the letter in verse 7, chapter 4, verse 7. As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. So Paul's in prison. Tychicus is going to deliver the letter. He's like a mailman. And uh, I've sent him for the very purpose that you may know about our circumstances. He may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number. So Onesimus is from Colossae. Um, and they will inform you about the whole situation here. Uh, Aristarchus, uh, our fellow prisoner, uh, uh, sends you his greetings. Also Barnabas, cousin Mark, and so on. And Jesus, who's called Justice. These are the only fellow workers who are from the circumcision. So those are the Jews. But then you have Epaphras in verse 12, who's a faithful member. And Luke in verse 14 and in verse uh, 17 and say to Archippus so that he's, you know, when you get this letter back to Colossae, Arch Archippus is there. Uh, tell him, take heed to the ministry which you've received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. So he's likely uh, the preacher there uh, at the church. So, but anyway, that's the other mention of, of uh, Onesimus. So I'm going back to... Uh, uh, Philemon now. So it's a very personal letter, but also it's kind of a letter, early Christian missionary type work, things that would normally happen. Paul's getting older in verse nine, 
uh, Philemon 9, verse 9. Yet for the uh, love's sake, I rather appeal to you since I am such a person as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So Paul is getting up there. He's getting, you know, he gets out of here. Um, or uh, at least if he's not out of there, which I think that he is, that uh, because it's kind of a loosely held uh, situation that probably he leaves and is able, it gets out of prison. He didn't, he didn't keep him there forever at times. Um and, you know, far more imprisonments when he talks about that in 2 Corinthians 11. So he's imprisoned many times. And, uh, and so uh, he, the last letter he writes is 2 Timothy. So this one is close to that. Probably we're getting around maybe the year 62 AD. So 30 years after Jesus, uh, Paul is writing this from a, a likely Roman house arrest. Some people think Paul got out of prison and then got rearrested and put back in prison uh, in like 63 or so. Um, now the, the uh, some of the historians think that that's the way it flows. But we know when Paul, when uh, Luke writes the book of Acts, how it ends is very open that uh, we we'll turn there real fast, the end of, Luke, end of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts chapter 28. Um so, you know, Luke's been traveling with Paul off and on, and Luke is getting, you know, information from Paul uh, to write in his gospel and in the book of Acts. They also meet in Jerusalem. They meet James, the brother of Jesus, who'd been converted and became kind of one of the main leaders in the church in uh, Jerusalem. And the elders and likely the other apostles met with them as well. So Luke's documenting, writing all these things down. But he is especially tracking Paul's activities. First part of Acts deals largely with Peter and his activities as an apostle. Hardly anybody else is mentioned. And hardly any other apostles are mentioned in the second half of Acts, which is largely about Paul and his ministry to the Gentiles. So when it ends in chapter 28, uh, Paul has tried to talk to the Jews, which was his custom. Go to the Jews first. And, uh, and some of them listened. Some of them didn't. And so... Uh, Paul says in verse 28, chapter 28, verse 28, let it be known to you, therefore, that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will also listen. And when he had spoken these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute among themselves. And he was staying, he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters uh, and was welcoming all who came. So he's, he's a, a loose house arrest, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. So nobody telling him to stop talking about Jesus. I've had people tell me that uh, off and on to stop talking about Jesus, different places. Lithuania was one of them where I was told to stop talking. Um, and, uh, but I've had it happen here as well. Um, and sometimes it's not my fault. So uh, Libby will tell me to stop talking sometimes. Uh, so, but what's interesting is that when, that Paul is under house arrest here, in uh, chapter 28 of, of Acts, verse 20, verse 20, 20, chapter 28, verse 20. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. So he's locked, he's, he's, he's moving about freely, but he's not 100% free. Um, and I'm uh, going back to Philemon, but I'm making the point Sunday morning in class, probably this Sunday, that is it was a badge of honor to be martyred. You know, Stephen, Luke doesn't hesitate to write about him, doesn't hesitate to write about some of the persecutions that the Christians go through, like Paul and Silas and like Peter and John and so on. Um, and he, he's quick with his pen to write about uh, James, the, uh, the brother of John, the two brothers of Zebedee, <clears throat> that uh, he has his head chopped off in chapter 12, verse 2 of Acts. So if Paul was, was killed, executed in the, in the mid-60s, um, he's still alive here when Luke writes, you know, if, if he had been killed, Luke would have written it. He would have written, you know, and, and of course they killed Paul, you know, he went in front of him, he went into the, uh, into the government, the government chopped his head off and so on. It's nothing there. It's left open and the, the, uh, 
most likely scenario is Paul is still alive when Luke wrote the book of Acts. So this idea that, well, Luke wrote, somebody put Luke's name on it, wrote it in the middle of the second century, uh, that, that it's just crazy, some of the stuff they come up with. And, uh, uh, and the point would be then that Luke wrote in the early 60s the book of Acts, and he wrote the gospel of Luke before that. And Luke and Matthew borrowed from Mark, who wrote before them. So we're getting back close, very close. It's not 300 years down the road and so on. So anyway, back to Philemon. So uh, it is a bit of a neglected book, Philemon is. Well, not a bit of it. It's very neglected. And I, I liken it to uh, if you have like if you have hotels on Mediterranean and Baltic Avenue, it really doesn't mean much in Monopoly, right? If you know how to play Monopoly. Uh, you know, those are the first ones that you leave go. And, uh, you know, it doesn't cost hardly anything. If you got Park Place and Boardwalk, whoo, you're big stuff, you know. Uh, and Philemon is kind of like that. It's not really uh, treated. Paul wrote 13 letters. It does kind of go with the longest letter to the shortest. You know, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, they start getting smaller. Um, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> with Philemon, obviously, there's... 335 words in Greek in the whole letter. Um, and I didn't count them, but I, uh, uh, one of the scholars that I trust said that. So, whereas when Paul writes the church at Colossae, he writes about a problem with the church. When he writes to Philemon, a member of the church, it's a much more personal issue. So, uh, what's happened? We'll read. If you don't know, some of you may, may not have ever read Philemon. What happens is Philemon uh, is a Christian. Onesimus either had a, an assignment to go somewhere and never came back. He was a slave of Philemon, uh, which uh, we'll talk about slavery. But slavery was in, in the first century wasn't like slavery in America back in the 1800s and so on. Um, people sold themselves into slavery. Some people in slavery were doctors, businessmen accountants, teachers, etc. Some slave masters, some masters were bad, but a lot of times the slave ended up, he was part of the family unit or there, and his family was part of the family unit. Um, and so anyway, so Onesimus leaves, somehow leaves, he runs away or whatever, but he doesn't come back. And he meets Paul, gets connected to Paul, since Paul had, uh, had written to the Colossians, Paul had never been to Colossae, if you remember, in chapter two, he says, uh, I pray for all those who have not personally seen my face. He never met, he never had been to Colossae, but they knew of Paul. So Onesimus meets up with Paul. Of all the places he could have gone, could have gone on a ship and, and headed it into Rome and hid out in a, you know, in a, a populated area where nobody could find him. Uh, but he hadn't met up with Paul and he turns his life over to Jesus and is baptized into Christ. And so now, Paul is going to send him back and wants Philemon to accept him back, not as a slave, but now he's also your brother. So it's really, a, it's a pretty cool letter. So uh, let's, let's read it together. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Apia, our sister, and to Archippus, our, brothers, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I heard of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed, refreshed through you, brother. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do that which is proper, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, the aged, and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, Onesimus which means useful in Greek, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. And I have sent him back to you in person, that is sending my very heart, whom I wished to keep with me, 
that in your be your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel but without your consent i did not want to do anything that your goodness should not be as it were by compulsion but of your own free will for perhaps he was for this reason parted from you for a while that you should have him back forever no longer as a slave but more than a slave a beloved brother especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, lest I should mention to you that you owe me to me, even your own self as well. Yes, brother. Let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you will do even more than what I say. And at the same time, also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I shall be given to you. Epaphras, our fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So it's a, it's a, Paul is, uh, has a way, doesn't he? Um, I'm not ordering you, but I would like to kind of remind you about, you know, the, you know, you're a little indebted to me, buddy. And, uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, uh, Paul has a lot of wisdom, Christian wisdom. And of course, Paul is writing, uh, when he says I'm writing with my own hand, maybe that he has a secretary and he's, and he's just letting them know, uh, you know, we see like in Romans 16, where you have a guy that is is a uh, is writing for Paul, and Paul oversees it, and it's exactly what Paul once said as an apostle, and the Holy Spirit is breathing through the pen of Paul as he writes uh, that it's exactly, exactly what God wanted to have said. So, but that doesn't mean God doesn't use their individual personalities. So, you know, Luke is a doctor, and so when Luke in the Gospels talks about somebody who's sick or in the book of Acts, he'll use some deeper medical terminology than uh, Matthew, Mark, and John would. And, uh, you know, uh, John is a fisherman. His Greek is, is rougher. You know, so God's using their individual personalities, their individual skills. Paul is a massive theologian, Pharisee, raised in under the feet of Gamaliel in chapter 22 of, uh, of Acts that we read. So he's a very learned Jew, very intelligent guy, and uh, God uses that. And so when Paul writes, the Holy, the Holy Spirit is uh, breathing through his pen, but it's not like Paul or anybody else who writes is just zapped, and they're just writing, you know, uh, they're, uh, God's using them, miraculously using them in their personalities, and it's exactly what God wants written. Um, Kind of like what Luke says, so that you will know the exact truth of the things you've been taught That when he writes Luke chapter 1, verse 4. So uh, Onesimus was a slave and had run away um, and didn't come back. Maybe he stole money, uh, you know, in verse 18, if he's wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. And so, uh, but it may be that just that him not being there cost uh, Philemon some money. Uh, and not being there, uh, he's provided for. And so uh, uh, he, he may be in debt in some, in some way. And so he stays in Rome. He helps Paul. Um, and then Paul sends him back uh, to Philemon with Tychicus, the guy that's carrying the letter. He comes back with him. And Onesimus left Philemon as a thief, maybe, but definitely as a fugitive. A runaway, but he's going to return as a brother in the Lord. So it's going to be a bit of a challenge probably for Philemon uh, to, uh, to let all that uh, shake out. It's also interesting in uh, the end of the letter, you have, um, and I won't come back to this. I don't have this in my notes. Uh, in verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner. Well, you know, when Paul writes Colossians, he says in chapter one, you learn the gospel from Epaphras. And uh, now Epaphras is in prison with Paul. 
And so he joined up somewhere. And then verse 24, as do Mark. Remember Mark, he's kind of shunned by Paul in chapter 15 of Acts. But now he's back with Paul. So they have, things have worked out. Uh, Demas is mentioned. If you remember in the end of 2 Timothy 4, Demas has left, uh, having loved this present world, has deserted me. So Demas, uh, in between this letter and 2 Timothy, probably not that much time has lapsed. Demas has left, gone back into the world. Um, and obviously Mark has left. Mark was with him here, but in the end of Timothy, he says, send oh, Mark. Yeah, yeah, send John Mark, he's useful to me. Yeah, so he's left and come back again. That's why I say probably the timing on this, it may be a little longer. You know, Paul even says, I hope that through your prayers I'll be given to you, that he may have got out of prison and then ended up back in prison. <laughs> um, so, and then Luke, of course, Paul was smart to have Luke travel with him because he's getting beat up all the time. Uh, to have a doctor with him is, is helpful. Um, so, uh, so Paul's deal is in verse 11, you need to receive him back because he has changed. He was, he was useless. Now he's useful, which Onesimus means useful. And so he's changed his life. What are you going to do when somebody changes their life? Somebody's done you wrong. And, and now they've become a Christian, you know, what do you do? And, uh, I mean, we've heard, probably all heard of some amazing stories of, you know, families that even had their child murdered and, uh, and the guy is in prison and the family member goes and teaches him about Jesus. Uh, and they become friends. I mean, then one guy got paroled and, and the, and the mother of the daughter that was killed and the guy I've seen them speak. It's been a long time. They were they would go and speak together and give testimony on the idea of forgiveness, and uh, and so you know you think about uh, you know re, when somebody changes, what are you going to do? And uh, I mean, bottom line is, if somebody if somebody changes, what does God do? The angels, there's rejoicing in heaven. Somebody's offended God greatly and they change their lives, and they start following Jesus, there's rejoicing in heaven. And, you know, I can tell you, like, our, our Monday night recovery group, somebody uh, uh, relapses, and when they come back, they're, you know, they might come back six months later or two months later or whatever. They come back. They've been afraid to come back, you know, because they just they feel so ashamed and so on. And everybody's so happy they're back. No, no, nobody's like, man, we're wondering where you were, you know, and uh, there's none of that. And the same is true here. When somebody comes back, we're just, we're just thankful they've come back. They don't owe us anything. It's between them and God. And our, our ministry as individual Christians is, hey, we just need to love people and, and try to help them. That's what our, our, we want, we want them here so they can get their life on track. Last thing we want to do is discourage somebody because we won't, we're upset with them and we won't forgive them. They go off and they, and they fall, uh, go way off and never come back to God. And uh, uh, I don't want to be standing on the judgment day with that on my, on my conscience, you know? Uh, so Paul is telling uh, Philemon, you know, Hey, um, I've begotten him in prison and he was formerly useless. Now he's useful and I'm sending him back to you in person. Uh, and I'm sending my very heart. And in verse 13, he says, I wish to keep him with me that in your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel that he has become useful. God's using Onesimus to be of value inside the kingdom of God. So uh, it's, a, it's all it's a coming up all roses, you know. Verse 16, he's, you should accept him back because he's a brother in the Lord now. And... Uh, uh, and instead of, you know, just looking at him, no, I don't care. He ran off, you know, and he owes this and this person did wrong to me. And, you know, the, uh, you know, man, uh, uh, you know what Jesus says, right? Uh, if you forgive others, the father in heaven will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, neither will your heavenly father forgive you. So there's a, uh, and the reason we don't forgive is really pride, uh, ego. I was done wrong. I didn't deserve that, you know, and, they got to pay a price. I got to get even, you know, and <clears throat> that's all pride. And uh, it takes humility 
uh, to, to forgive someone. And it doesn't hurt for us to live by the premise, but for the grace of God, there go I. And, um, you know, we all, we've all made a mess here and there. And so, uh, uh, be willing to forgive. Uh, one of the guys in recovery years ago, I helped him get his 20 year chip a few years ago over in Irving. Uh, Mike is his name. Good guy. Um, but, uh, he, he had, a, he had a problem staying sober. And part of his problem was cause he had so much, he had, he had so much resentment towards some people and the resentment because resentment is the number one reason for relapse for drug addicts and alcoholics. And um, the other one is they like to get, they like to escape, you know, self-medicate. No alcohol is the Novocaine to the brain. Anyway, uh, so when he finally dealt with his resentments and was willing to forgive, uh, he never drank again. No more cocaine, no more alcohol. And uh, uh, he moved over to East Texas, Texarkana. I had him come here and speak one when he got no, it was, it was a different time from when he got his 20 year chip, but he came and spoke one night. He was in Dallas for some reason and his, his accent is so bad. And he's got all these cliches and slogans. I was like, man, you're like, like talking to somebody from a foreign country. I can't understand what he's saying anymore. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know what he was talking about. Great guy. Um, his, uh, wife divorced him and then he's, uh, and she got killed in a car wreck. And he married a, a woman that had the same first name as his first wife. <laughs> Be easy to remember, I guess, if there's any pluses to it. Uh, anyway, uh, in verse 18, Paul says, accept him back because I'll, I'll take care of his debt. If that's what it, if that's what it takes. Verse 18, he's wronged in any way. Oh, is he any charge that to my account? Verse 19, Paul, uh, fairly diplomatic. In verse 19 is, you know, you kind of uh, uh, owe me to some degree. And, uh, and it's interesting. He doesn't, uh, tell, um, uh, Philemon to just let him go. It's, it's more to love him. That's what I want you to do. I want you to love him. Uh, where is that in the letter? Um, uh, anybody see it? Let me know. Um, 16. 16? Mm -hmm. All right. No longer the slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the in the in the flesh and the yeah, but but a beloved as a beloved brother. Um, maybe that was the only statement Nine. that where is it? Nine. Nine. All right. For love's sake, I appeal to you. Uh so it's it's love is the uh you know, so that and that's I'm sure is the word agape. So it's like all out love, agape love you uh, is not based on on uh, emotion. It's based on the will that I choose to do what's right and love and forgive. Uh, it's a it, um, it's not that that he's lovable and it's not like that. We are lovable that Jesus died on the cross for us. Um, but God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's uh, that's agape love. And that's what. Uh, Paul is wanting him to do. So forgiveness is a big issue in this letter. Philemon needed to forgive him and accept him back. Brotherly love is a big issue. Um, you know, and he says in verse four and five, I thank my God always making, you know, you know, that Paul's letters almost always have a prayer of thanksgiving and a prayer of petition. Your prayer of thanksgiving is verse four and following. I thank my God always making mention of you in my prayers because I hear of your love. And of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective. Um, and uh, so it's a, a brotherly love is what Paul is really uh, aiming for in, uh, in Philemon. And I think it is verse 16 as a beloved uh, brother, which is part of the word agape. Um, so verse 14, go ahead. in one of the verses it says, I want you to receive him as you would receive me. But that's, yeah. a, that's a big, bold statement because if Paul is revered by all these house churches that yep. he's mailing to, he's not asking him to receive Onesimus yeah. back as the person he was. He's asking him to receive him back as somebody yeah. of importance. Wow. And if you think about it, 
how hard would this have been for Onesimus to carry this letter back? Yeah. You know, this, that had to have been very tough, but he must have had a lot of confidence that that Philemon would be the guy. Yeah. Uh, and obviously he was <clears throat> because a letter like this would have been buried if it yeah. didn't happen. Well, this letter is out for everybody to read. I think yeah. it's sent to all the churches to teach them how to treat. Oh, that's a very good point that that this letter teaches Christians in churches how to get along. And the key is always is uh, it's not about me. It's about the Lord. And uh, and it's about God using me to be a blessing to other people. That's our goal. Uh, we have good unity here, and that's a lot of the reason why, Brent. Yeah, I was thinking about, you know, if you were to put in the mind of Philemon, you know, before he knew he was a Christian, you know, he probably had the right, the legal rights, to treat on this in a certain for way sure. when he came back. For sure. And in America, don't we talk about rights all, yeah, yeah. all the time? Yeah. And we don't have any rights in the church. That's right. We don't have rights. Yeah, and and that's really what Paul was saying. I think put that right away. That doesn't matter <clears> anymore. <throat> that slave owner relationship is gone. Yeah, and even though you might have had a right to treat him in a certain way, not in that's Christ, right. you know. Yeah, very good point. That uh, now he's a brother. It's a whole different ball game. But <clears throat> the getting out of ourselves and making it about it's kind of it's it. Uh, anytime individuals or a church or an organization turns inward, you're in trouble. You're in trouble because then people get selfish and it's about me. And he's thinking about me. She's thinking about me. And you got none, you got problems. And uh, so uh, getting, uh, uh, so that's why part of being a mission church, which that's why I say, I don't, you know, I don't care how long the church has been open. We're a mission work. That's how who we are. And I probably have told the story before, you know, the I didn't I probably told it in here a month ago, did I? Uh, the dad and the boy, and the boy takes his buddy out and they go fishing. Good. I'm glad you haven't heard. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. There's no bad words or anything in it. And uh, anyway, so they go out, they get the tent set up, they go to get in the boat, start fishing, and it starts raining. So, man, they're all excited, having fun. And they go back to the tent and start playing cards and laughing and talking and so on. And rains all night. Next morning, they get up to go fishing. It's still raining. And by noon, they're irritated with each other. And they're not getting along. The two bro two friends aren't getting along. And the dad's getting sick and tired of the boys. And, and, uh, and the moral of the story is fishermen who don't fish fight. And in a church, fishermen that don't fish, if we're not looking for how can God use us as a church, be like what Paul is telling Philemon to do. If we get out of ourselves and we make it about God using us to help others, that's way more fulfilling than making, meeting our own needs. It's way better. Uh, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive uh, in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. And so it's, it's way better. Uh, the blessings that come uh, from being used by God are way better than getting my, what, I want, what I want filled. And uh, uh, anyway, so I think Philemon, that has a value to it because of that. Connie? I think that as sadly as Philemon is neglected, I honestly believe this should be where the foundation of everybody's Christian yeah. education begins is yeah. with Philemon. Yeah. Because Philemon teaches us on both sides of the fence. If we have been the one that owes a debt, that we be brave enough to, to face Own up to it. Yeah. And it also to the person who was wrong, you know, I think it should be the basis of how yeah. we behave as Christians yeah. Yeah. is how we treat one another. Yeah. And it's it's a yeah, it's perfect, good. simple yeah. lesson to learn. Yeah, that's why I said it uh, one of the scholars said it was a um, um It was a, it's more, uh, it's an instrument of early Christian missionary work. Uh, I can't remember who does the word biblical commentary, but they're the premier uh, commentaries. Uh, name slips my mind right now, but, uh, but I think you're right. that This is a good, for a short little letter, it's, it's really packed. Raul? I heard, oh, go ahead. 
why I'd heard criticism that a lot of people don't like finding them because it showed that slavery happened. But really, what it shows is that in this case, slavery was abolished. It was asked to be yeah. removed. And so I think it's a, a perfect letter to start yeah. with. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Raul? The word says that if we don't have love, we don't have God. Right. So if you don't have love, yeah. Yep. You got nothing. Yeah. And uh, Mike? Yeah, it just harkens back to uh, Philippians 2 5 through 11. And it says, let, he, or he says uh, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And talking about humility, yep. not seeking your way. So Paul's really using that same dynamic to Philemon. Very good. So don't. Don't be uh, self-centered, demanding, but rather be like Christ. Have the mindset of Christ, yep. and He humbled Himself, didn't expect or seek His way. Yep. Be like that. Yep. It's very good. Yeah. Philippians two, <clears throat> uh, when He talks about don't do things from selfishness or empty conceit. <clears throat> Consider uh, others more important than yourself. That's a that's a that's a challenge. Um, as far as slavery, there's 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 a lot of mistaken ideas about that by the skeptics or critics of the Bible um, that uh, one of the reasons why they don't like the Bible is because God, the Bible is in favor of slavery. There's not a verse that teaches the Bible is in favor of slavery. God was not in favor of slavery. Uh, Paul was not in favor of slavery. Anybody ever hear, he's dead now, Dr. Gene Scott, guy, the guy from California that would uh, had a captain's hat on. He would smoke cigars while he would preach. And uh, he blows the smoke into the camera. And uh, oh man, you, if you can get any of it on YouTube, it's worth watching. But anyway, he said, uh, 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 Paul, Paul was in favor of slavery. He was wrong about that. And uh, now don't get me wrong, Paul was a genius. But even geniuses make mistakes. And he goes, I got married. And then he takes a puff on the cigar and blows it into the camera. Oh, man, that's a classic line. Uh, anyway, but uh, anyway, but he's wrong. He, uh, Paul was not in favor of slavery. There's nowhere in the Bible where it, what happens is slavery is part of the socioeconomic uh, 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 fabric of the culture. A third to a half of the people in the Roman culture, a uh, Roman empire, were slaves. But some slaves... Uh, manage the children, uh, had their own slaves. Some slaves had their own slaves. It's, it's, it's totally different than what when we think of that word. It isn't the criticism, though, is that Paul didn't condemn it. Okay, and that's, yeah. I, mean, yeah, that, yeah. I think that's, that's probably the stronger criticism. Sure. But to your point is, people that make that criticism <clears throat> are looking at slavery in America in the, in, <laughs> right. in the 1700s, 1800s, etc. But then there's things like if you uh, were converted as a slave, stay a slave. If you can be free, it's okay. In First Corinthians seven, uh, and what what Paul is always concerned about, what God is concerned about, is the furtherance of the gospel, souls being saved. And so, as a for instance, in First Corinthians six, why not be wrong? Don't be taking a brother brother taking brother to court, and the Gentile, the the pagans see that and they criticize Christian in the name of Jesus is is uh, insulted uh, because you're demanding your right there, it's better to be wrong than to do that. And so slavery is a little bit like that. It'd be like uh, a worker, before a Christian worker goes on strike, today they need to think about uh, how does that, how does that hurt my Christian influence? Should I go on board? Should I get on board with that? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll damage my potential to help some of the people around me, fellow workers and so on. Uh, what if I you know, sign a petition against a teacher or an administrator to get them fired? And, you know, you, you sign that and maybe, you know, you may have to abstain and just say, you know, what, I'm not comfortable doing that. And some of it is we do things because of the influence of the gospel. What happens is Christianity, elim if, if the Christian movement would have rose up against slavery, it, we probably would never have become Christians. They'd have stomped out Christianity uh, as fast as they could. What happens is agape love ends up eliminating 
slavery. Over the next uh, decades and a couple of centuries, slavery dissipates into nothing, and it's because of the Christian influence. Uh, you know, it's Christians. Christianity is the ones that started hospitals. Christianity is the ones that started orphanages. Christianity is the ones that started, you know, educational systems in these, some of these areas. Uh, and uh, so the the idea that uh, Paul uh, was in favor of it or Paul should have said something against it, um, we, we had bigger fish to fry. First of all, the, the, you know, a lot of the slaves were had good masters, you know, and uh, they were more like employees. It was more like an employer-employee relationship. And uh, and what God's always thinking about is, is saving souls. What's the best way to go about that? And if a person has to suffer for people to become Christians, a Christian, or if, if they have to give up some of their rights, if they're like in slavery and they, and they uh, stay that way rather than uh, fight against it, um, they, we give up our rights. Sometimes, you know, we, we take one for the, uh, for the, for the team. Sometimes we have to do that as Christians. Uh, I've had to do it as a preacher. And I mean, I've known preachers that when, when they decide with an eldership, the eldership wants them to move on, that they cause damage on their way out. That's selfish. You want to, if you're going to leave a church, you leave it in the best use. You, you take a bullet if you have to, but you don't do damage like that because you have the right to do that. They did this. They did that. No, they don't have any rights as a Christian. We have a responsibility for the kingdom and to Jesus. And we let Jesus take care of it. And when we uh, suffer to a degree uh, and we stay faithful and we don't have this rebellious, selfish, get angry and resentful kind of thing, but we just continue to do what's right, especially when it's hard, God always has a way and finds a way to bless that person. God will bless people who will do what's right especially when it's hard. It happens all the time. You know, Joseph in the Old Testament, all the things that happened to him, gets thrown in the prison, but the Lord God was with, with Joseph, Joseph. You know, when initially when his brothers sold him into slavery, but the Lord was with Joseph. God had a plan. If, if Joseph hadn't gone down into Egypt, we would have never heard about Jesus, or what am I, we'd be dead before he ever, uh, maybe he didn't get here for 10,000 years. Uh, and so we, we are called to do some suffering and whatever position you're in, you don't become a rebel and demand your rights. It's better. Uh, golly, you should see the things that happen sometimes in Cambodia with us. Some of the stuff that happens and some of the stuff that Sakom goes through for the sake of the kingdom. It's unbelievable. Uh, some, I mean, they, one of his cars got taken. Had, his daughter gave him a car. We got to go. But his daughter gave him a car, had it shipped over from America. And a Muslim leader that we had partnered with uh, took the car from him. And Scomb said, I have to, I, I said, well, I was over there when this was all going down. I thought, I'm never going to get out of here. And uh, I'm going to be here for the rest of my life or I'll be dead. And uh, they, it didn't get settled before I got there, before I left. And when I got home, I asked Scomb what happened. And it was, you know, a week later. So he said, he said, I ended up, I had to give him my, my, my daughter, the car my daughter gave me. And uh, uh, if I didn't, I was going to have to go. To, uh, he'd got, I'd have to go to jail. And I can't, I, don't, I, I can't let things slow down right now. So you see what he's saying? If I don't give him the car, I won't be able to keep doing this ministry the way I need to do it. So I'll, just, I'll sacrifice and suffer and give him the car. I mean, there, this is, there's things like that. Several things have happened to us like that. And so we have to think like that. We need to think like that here, that we're willing to, to, to uh, sacrifice for the sake of God using this church to help people come to Christ. And so we make sacrifices and you know what? It's, uh, it's good. You know, uh, we, you know, when Peter and John were beat up in prison, when they got out and were threatened, uh, they're going to get killed if they kept it up. They said they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day uh, from house to house and in the temple, they kept right on preaching Jesus as the Christ. And, you know, so uh, that's what that's what we want to do. Mike, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, real quick announcement. Uh, Mike's sermon Sunday about prayer and then mentioned that the uh, uh, using the parlor room down the hall there.